Hi, everybody. I hope everybody enjoyed the uh, first day of the conference. Uh, my name is Lawrence Lau. I'm a first year student here at MIT Sloan, and I'm the student lead for the ticketing analytics panel. We have a very distinguished list of speakers here today, and I want to introduce them to you. We have uh, Kelly Cheeseman from the Los Angeles Kings. We have um, Robert Gallo from the NFL, Athena Makish from StubHub, Anthony Perez from the Orlando Magic, and we have Kurt Schwartzkopf from Ticketmaster. Moderating this panel is Patrick Risch. He's an economics professor at Webster University. This panel is going to run for an hour. Um, the last 15 minutes are going to be for Q&A. For q and I would ask that you just use the sports analytics app on your iPhone, on your tablet. Go to the Q&A section, and then you can go to the ticketing analytics pad, tab to ask your questions, and the moderator will ask the panelists these questions in the last 15 minutes of the session. And with that, I'll leave the rest of the session to our moderator, Mr. Patrick Risch. Thank you, Lawrence. Welcome, everyone. Well, for three of us up here, fixed pricing and combs went bye-bye a long time ago. Before we get started with our questions, uh, as a university professor for the last 17 years, uh, one thing I've learned is there's one way to get students engaged in discussions and conversations, and that's cash. So I've got a trivia question that you can tweet and if you get it right at the end of the session, there is cash money on the table, on the platform. So I'm going to push this question out. The question is very simple. You cannot use your devices. If you use your devices, you will not be expelled from your university, but you will be forced to watch every Philadelphia 76ers game for the rest of the season. So it's very simple. I want you to name for each of the four North American sports leagues the team that has the highest and lowest face value in each of the four North American sports leagues. And the tiebreaker is, of those eight teams, which has the highest and which has the lowest average price. So Lawrence will be uh, looking for winning bids. And if there's a winner, it could be 20 bucks. Ready That's two go. beers or sodas. <laughs> this morning, I tweeted a hashtag, my first time talking about the first time I bought a ticket on the secondary market. And if I could take you back in my hot tub time machine, it was 1985. I was at Olympic Stadium in Montreal watching my beloved Montreal Expos. $10 Canadian outside of Olympic Stadium that day got me in about 10 rows from the third baseline. So I, I opened it up with that piece, and I want to address my initial questions to both Kelly and Anthony. I did a little research before coming in this morning, looking at some of the buy-in prices on StubHub for their respective team's games. And so Kelly uh, first mentioned with the Kings that for the next two Saturdays, on March 7th, the Kings, $90 is the buy-in versus the Penguins. And on March 14th, it's $50 against the Predators. Anthony, with the Orlando Magic, the buy-in prices for the next two Sunday games, $14 for Charlotte and $24 versus the Celtics. Kelly, tell us a little bit about when the Kings decided to implement variable dynamic pricing, how you do it, and then Anthony, I'll ask you the same thing. Sure. Um, we started dynamic pricing back in, I think it was 2008, we were the us and the Dallas Stars were the first two teams in the league to start dynamic, dynamic, dynamic pricing with Stratbridge as, as our partner. Um, and we, we focused at that point on just kind of beta testing it. Um, we were going up $4, down $4 was kind of our max for the first year. Um, over time, we really studied the consumers, their behaviors related to it, how our season ticket members were reacting to it, how our partial plan members were reacting to it, and we didn't get much feedback from them at all. Uh, so the following year, we just started pushing it further and further and further, um, working with Stratbridge on you know, getting to the right place and then matching our, our package pricing accordingly in order to maximize uh, the, uh, the revenues across all the, all the streams. So. 
And Anthony, what's the experience with Orlando? Sure, for us, uh, we started with variable pricing. Um, we started testing that out in 2009. Uh, and then in 2010-11, when we opened up our new arena, that's when we went sort of full-blown variable pricing. We had seven different pricing tiers. And we did that for a couple years. And we've been using dynamic pricing pretty aggressively for the past three seasons. And what do you guys find in your, in your history? What factors are the biggest drivers to making those prices fluctuate? For, for, from like a day-to-day -day basis? For sure. Um, you know, I think for us, we're always sort of looking at the forecast of where we think we're going to end up for a game. And we may look to modify the price if we're seeing a decent amount of interest but low conversion rates. So those are some of the things that, that we kind of keep an eye on that we're always trying to, to tweak and maximize. I, I think there's a lot of factors related to like Anthony was saying, on the consumer behavior side. Um, but I think what it comes back to are the really simple answers, which is day of week opponent and you know the, the consumer interest in the game. I mean, if you have less capacity available, your, your price is able to drive higher. So um, you know, the, the very complex algorithms are, um, I think, kind of going out the door. And it comes back to more consumer behaviors at this point, point as it relates to dynamic pricing. Robert, what are you seeing in the NFL? Well, I think. You know, as it relates to uh, dynamic pricing, I agree with what Kel and Anthony are saying. I think from a demand standpoint, that's always going to drive pricing. I think it starts there. I think from, from there, it cascades down. We see um, on the secondary market uh, opponent driving price throughout our league um, pretty, pretty regularly. And then I think from there, we're lucky. We're fortunate. Um, I think a close second would be playoff implications. And, and, and the reason I say that in terms of driving demand or price is because we only have 16 games. And in a league where every game, every week, feels like do or die and feels like it has playoff implications, you see that driving price as well. Yeah, one, one thing that, I, that I'll just add to that, because I, I think those are, those are exactly right. And, so, and you, know, you know those things before the season starts. Um, you know who you're playing, you know when you're playing them, and, and we understand the historical trends. I think one thing that's interesting kind of bringing in um, like a StubHub and Ticketmaster in the conversation is another factor is just overall supply in the market, which, which does change daily, and I think that very much impacts the value um, of the tickets that are available for purchase. So that, I think that's a big driver of that dynamic pricing. Yeah, I, to add to that, I mean, and, and that's the beauty of the fact that we actually have this available to us as an industry now is that we're able to adjust versus just sitting on our hands and allowing somebody else to capitalize on, on the dollars. I mean, we can react to a lot of situations like playoff implications or if a player announces his retirement and it's going to be his last game of the year. And if you were sitting on, um, you know, a, a player like Luke Robitaille, who was the greatest king of all time, and we were a terrible team back in 2005, six, uh, we were able to change prices and go three times face and capitalize on the last, the last dollars we had and really maximize you know, revenue for our owner at that point. And, so. and backstage we were talking, the numbers that I gave at the beginning, where your Penguins game is 90 bucks and Nashville's 50, I assumed that it was the Crosby factor. Sidney Crosby, of course, plays with the Penguins, but you mentioned something else. Yeah, we're raising a statue for Luke. Luke, as team president, decided to put a statue up for himself. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. We decided to put up a statue for Luke because he's the greatest king. Well, it gives you something to aspire to. Once yeah. you're president, they'll put up a Cheeseman we, statue. We, we like to give him grief about that often. That's funny. Well, this is an analytics and technology conference. And uh, Athena and Kurt, I'll turn it to you. If you could tell me in your respective businesses, how has technology impacted the way you do business at StubHub and at Ticketmaster, respectively? Sure. So I think it's really allowed us to focus on the experience of the fan. So everything from our new Subhub Music app where you can discover an experience, right, data-driven there, to the prices you're seeing, right? I think in a great world, you have supply meeting demand. That's not always what's happening, right? So I think we're using data to make sure the customer is getting an efficient price. When we need to bring that price down, we allow the market to do that, and we incentivize the market to do that. All the way through to 80% of our, our mobile tickets if a venue allows, you can use that to get into the stadium. So a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity behind the scenes. Uh, at Ticketmaster, it, for our, our uh, clients out there, they know we have a pretty long list of innovation that, that we're just trying to keep up, make sure that uh, we're providing the best tools to the, to the teams. You know, whether it's PriceMaster, um, which is our dynamic pricing tool, 
we have about 25 teams across uh, NBA, NHL, NFL, or uh, MLB that are on that right now. Um, you know, our integration with Experience, uh, there's about 30 teams that are doing the upgrade app um, experience upgrades that teams are utilizing for better data, better understanding of their, of their customer, um, and they make a little money on it as well. And then you have integration with IO Media. Um, that's kind of all business to business technology um, innovations. And then you have the business to consumer side, which is really the Ticketmaster.com platform, uh, the, the kind of general public facing platform where TM Plus is a huge innovation over the last couple of years. Um, we have teams like Golden State and Portland and Orlando um, that are using that tool to make very good business decisions, um, connect deeper with their season ticket holders, understand their kind of 360 view of the customer a little better. Uh, it actually plays into the dynamic pricing modeling as well. So that's a, a huge innovation that's kind of changed the game in the last two years. And then um, I would say just the frictionless kind of mobile purchase flow from, uh, from a Ticketmaster.com standpoint, I think it still can get better, but every day we're, we're constantly hearing feedback from our teams and tweaking it and changing it, making it faster. So it's really two clicks to purchase and you're done. So We were talking about the fan, the customer experience earlier. You brought it up, Anthony. So from the team, from the league, and from, from the uh, resale perspective, how, how can you use technology to improve the fan experience with respect to purchasing tickets? Well, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of ways to do it. Kurt mentioned um, some of the things we're doing with experience, and I think that's a, that's a big focus for us, um, for season ticket holders as well as single game buyers. I mean, we're trying to reach them um, mobily on their devices and really enhance their experience once they're in the building. So seat upgrades are, are a big part of that. Um, I mentioned earlier when we were talking as a group, we launched a new product this year that was a seasonal pass, really aimed to attract a price-sensitive fan segment for us that we weren't really seeing buy our tickets uh, and making sure that we could differentiate that product. So it was only available on the mobile app. You didn't have guaranteed seat locations. You wouldn't find out where you were sitting until 15 minutes before the game. Um, and you could end up courtside or you could end up in the, the last row in the upper bowl. And it really was that random. Um, hugely successful for us, brought a lot of brand new buyers into the fold that we're now able to establish relationships with. So I think that's a great example of where technology has helped us sort of reach new customers um, and, and start to build relationships. I, I think from a league perspective, you know, I think it's much wider than just technology as it relates to buying tickets. We certainly work, uh, you know, uh, closely with uh, Ticketmaster and a, a number of our teams do as well uh, from a technological standpoint. But I think we spend a lot of our time at the league level also thinking about the in-stadium experience and game presentation and the overall experience from driveway to driveway. Um, and I think that's critical as well. So once you get them to buy a ticket, how do you keep, keep them coming back? And, and, and provide that value uh, that I think people are looking for in this day and age. Um, we too uh, work with the, uh, the guys from Experience um, from a league level perspective. A number of our teams are working with uh, the, the guys from Experience as well. Uh, traditionally, I think from an NFL perspective, um, our teams have probably been late adopters. You know, the world has changed, as we like to say back in the league office. You know, five, ten years ago, you open up the front gate and 70,000 people would walk in. That doesn't happen anymore. So we're seeing more and more of our teams uh, adopt different technologies and different tactics, but across the board, not just as it relates to buying a ticket, uh, as it relates to the game presentation uh, in-stadium experience. Um, we, this year at Super Bowl 49, did an in-stadium app, really for the first time. We worked with the guys from Experience um, on that app um, to enhance that experience. And we offered everybody in attendance an opportunity to win once in a lifetime experiences, getting on the field, Super Bowl 50 tickets, things like that, it was also a data capture tool for us as well, so that we can have that information in our database. And from a team perspective, that's really important, so you can go back and remarket to these folks. And I think what we're also seeing too is, is the personalization of an experience, right? Before it was fans as a group, right? Now it's, it's me as a fan going to a game. Um, and you know, at StubHub, you see that in different ways. We're testing out personalization when you come to the site. So what's the best value we can give you, knowing you? What's, if you're looking for price, are you looking for the best section? Can we recommend a ticket to you in that? 
Is price really important to you? If it is, set a price alert right on the site, and that way you get to know when a ticket comes in that price, and and that's going to be different for me and Bobby, right? His might be eighty, my might be seventy. Robert, or, Robert. <laughs> and mine might be seventy-five. Um, but you know, we still it, it's different for every person, and I think that's important too. I think on our mobile app, you see push notifications, right, that remind you, oh, okay, I was looking at. I was looking at Sesame Street Live. I forgot to buy it. Let me let me do that, right? So again, a movement I think towards personalization, which the data is really allowing to drive. I, I think I think that's huge. I think it's a great point. I think that's huge because we're we're in a business. Again, we talk a lot about this at the league office. We're in a business where it's one to many, and it's how do you how do you take that and, and create a one to one relationship um, with your fans and, and, and your customers, um, and, and really kind of push out to them what what they want, right? Uh, we talk to a lot of our teams on a regular basis, and we hear often that we're doing more and more today than we've ever done before. But I'm not sure that that's the right answer. It, it, it's not about just throwing more at the fan or the consumer. It's about providing them what they want. And I think Amazon's a great example of that. Um, they do a really good job of, of, of segmenting and targeting and, and providing you offers that uh, may appeal to you or that they think may appeal to you as opposed to just wide scale. Well, and I think it's important because with <clears throat> Amazon and Google and these companies that are doing that, that it's now incumbent upon us to offer that same experience because consumers expect it. Yeah. So you know, I think personalization, as we talk about all the digital channels that are out there to, to reach uh, consumers and, and big data, it really comes down to personalization. And there is an expectation that we talk to everybody like we know them, like we understand what they're looking for with a relevant message and those types of things. So I think that's critical going forward. And Patrick, it ties back to price. Right? If you're offering somebody what they want, price is always going to matter. Um, but my wife last week got a, an email from Amazon for a Lego for my son who you know, loves Legos. And they know he loves Legos. And not only do they know he loves Lego, they know which, which brand Lego he likes. Right? They have Lego City. They have Lego the movie. They have all these different Lego sets. They know exactly what he likes and what he wants. And I don't think if... if, if we get that email and it's $150 for the Lego set, it doesn't matter if it was $250, we're buying that Lego set for him. Conversely, if it was $40 for that Lego set, but, but it was a set that he doesn't like to use or build with, we're not buying it. So it all ties back to price as well. I, th I think it also speaks to a lot of the loyalty platforms that, that the teams are implementing now is, you know, for adding value to creating the value to, to getting people to buy season tickets, is a, it's, Season tickets is an irrational purchase. It's, we have to do something to, to build up that value in order to um, give them the ability to make that decision on an annual basis. So you know, the loyalty platforms are a great opportunity for people to kind of choose their own adventure within the benefits of their season ticket packages versus us having this rigid list of 10 benefits that we've always had for years of 10% off of the team store and you know, two free sodas at, at the... Uh, at the uh, the concession stands, we have to change. We have to we have to be different than we have been for years because people have choice, and you know it's it, we're we're competing with that, and our our player costs aren't going down, so we have to keep our season ticket prices, our season ticket revenues there. We talked about season tickets backstage, and I mentioned a few years ago I had a chance to speak with several ticket managers from Major League Baseball teams, and one of the things they talked about when they dynamically priced their tickets is they wanted to make sure that they didn't go below the season ticket price. And interestingly enough, backstage, I learned that one of your two teams kind of adheres to that, and Anthony, the Magic, don't necessarily. And I'm just wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about your respective philosophies regarding that. Yeah, it's, I mean, again, it's, it's, it is philosophy. I mean, for us, our season ticket members are everything, and we want to protect that piece. Not to say that it's the wrong, the right or the wrong thing to do, um, but it's just been our strategy since the beginning of implementing dynamic pricing. However, next year, for the first time, and this will not be innovative at all, um, we, want to, we want to dynamically price our season tickets. Not dynamically price because you've already invoiced them, but we'll, put, we'll post different prices on their, their tickets in order to give us a little bit more flexibility on games and maximize the revenues a little bit differently. So in order to still be able to protect that season ticket member price. Yeah, so I, I think for us, you know, we, <clears throat> we do that as well. We variably price our season tickets. Um, and, you know, in what I mentioned backstage, when five years ago when we first started a, a much more robust variable, variable pricing system and variably pricing season tickets. We really emphasize to our season ticket holders, uh, 
you will always pay the lowest price for any game. And, and I think over time, we kind of learned that that wasn't necessarily the right message. Um, what we really try to emphasize with our season ticket holders is that they're getting the best value. So we're trying to get away from what the price of a particular game is relative to what we may price through other channels and starting to emphasize the overall price. Uh, they will get the best value from a price perspective in the, in the bigger picture, as well as all the other things that we offer to our season ticket holders to, to show them that we value them and how important they are as our customers. That being said, um, because factors do change over time leading up to games, there, there has been a need at different points to lower prices in certain areas where it does go below um, season ticket pricing, and um, we haven't been afraid to do that. Uh, and, and so, and I think it's worked really well. We haven't had a blowback from customers because I think they understand, and um, you know, it's, uh, so it's worked well for us, and, and we've gotten very comfortable with that approach. That being said, it's not something that we do um, across the board in any, in any large scale, but there are times when it's needed, and I think the other thing about that is when we see those things that are necessary from a price perspective, if it's happening too often, we start to look and say, well, is there something we need to do overall about the price? And so that'll obviously be reflected in the season ticket prices going forward. Um, so we make those adjustments as well. Talk about all-in pricing uh, to Athena and, and Kurt, as opposed to the fee-based model that used to exist, still exists in some places. Why the transition? What are the effects of the transition? Sure. So for those folks in the room who aren't aware, all-in pricing is a policy that StubHub adopted about a year ago. Um, and what it is is when you come to, to StubHub.com and you see a price, that's the price that you check out at. So any fees are in that base price, and we're not going to add anything as you go along. It's, it was the number one thing that, that customers wanted. Um, and we listened to that, and so you know we implemented our product to, to include that. I think you know with the increased competition in the marketplace, and with over half of this room wanting to be a comparison shopper, I think as you'll see as we get farther into the year, we're going to make that experience better for you, so that when you come to the site, you can see our price, but you can also start to understand what that price looks like versus a competitor to show that you're really getting a good value on StubHub versus today, you're not 100% sure because if you come and you don't know about the all-in pricing and you go to compare to a competitor, we may look a bit higher at first because they're tacking on fees. So really starting, you know, move to, move to a customer-centric policy there and then the product is really going to start to get there by the end of the year to, to match that policy. And I, I would just add that I think for our teams, it's really up to the teams. Um, they have more data on that, that transaction. We, we help them come to a conclusion, but ultimately it's a team's decision. Uh, we have teams like the Atlanta Hawks, Atlanta, or, uh, Anaheim Ducks. They do all-in pricing um, on their transactions, and that's a team decision. We support it. There's a lot of data uh, that, that shows that transaction is helpful in some areas and maybe not in others, but I think it's still early on to determine what's best for each team because every market's so different. Um, Talk a little bit more about PriceMaster. A couple of years ago at this conference, Ticketmaster announced that they were going to <coughs> unveil their new dynamic pricing modeling as a uh, competitor to QQ and Diginex and some of the other companies out there. So talk a little bit more, uh, more about the, the genesis of that sure. and how it's played out. Well, I think PriceMaster, no different than StrapBridge, it's just another tool for the teams to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in the business to make sure, whether it's TM Plus or it's PriceMaster, to give our teams the tools to help them run their business uh, quickly and efficiently. And in our, as we all know, prices change quickly all the time. So the more data you can give them in real time, they can make, you know, five years ago it would take five days to get a price code changed, right? And and now it's all done in real time, it's all integrated as it should be, and, and people can make good business decisions and make their companies more money um, and maximize opportunity through those tools. I mean, 25 teams on PriceMaster at this point kind of speaks for itself. Um, you know, you can ask Anthony his experience on that model, but again, it's their suggestions, right? The, the tool is there to help you make good decisions, and not all the time will you take the suggestions. You'll have a gut instinct as a CMO to go, well, I think that's pushing the envelope a little bit, and that, that has to weigh in. Um, and, and it, but if you just want to take the recommendations and say yes, then off you go. It's been a huge success. It's interesting, the dynamic of, of course, back in the day, as I said, 30 years ago, you're buying tickets from somebody on the street. Then, of course, when, when StubHub and others come online, you can buy tickets individually. But we've had team exchange sites 
now. And of course, the NFL has a relationship with Ticketmaster. Talk a little bit about the transition to team exchange. Well, I think, you know, I think we're, we're very happy with, you know, um, the relationship we have with Ticketmaster and Ticket Exchange, uh, NFL Ticket Exchange. Um, I think there's a number of benefits to it, quite frankly. Um, certainly the authentication piece, right, and the validity of, of knowing your ticket is secure um, from both, uh, you know, from a buyer's perspective, but also from a seasoned ticket member perspective, the seamlessness of uploading your ticket and, and using the... the uh, the uh, ticket exchange and the integration to the ticketing system. 31 of our 32 teams are Ticketmaster clubs, so there's a, uh, you know, an integration and seamlessness there. Um, so I think you know that that's all very important. I also think team exchanges add a validity to the secondary market as a whole. Um, you know, going back 10, 15 years, um, I'm not sure how confident people were per se in the secondary market. A lot of it was hand-to-hand -hand combat, and you were kind of just you know, exchanging tickets and, and, and money. But I think now people are very comfortable transacting on the secondary market, uh, whether it be a team exchange, whether it be through StubHub. They have a great customer service program um, a, a, as well. And so I think it's really um, transformed the entire secondary market um, for, for everybody. The experience this year with the Super Bowl, I hope all of you could perhaps comment on, if you don't recall, usually, uh, secondary prices will come down significantly as you approach game time. But that did not happen for this year's Super Bowl. So could you explain what happened? And, of, of course, uh, some companies, uh, smaller companies, smaller brokers, really got burned. Can you talk a little bit about what happened? Sure. Kurt, do you want to start with the background, and then I'll take it? Well, I, I, you know, from the Super Bowl, since I oversee NBA and NHL, I'm only on the fringe of that kind of process. Um, but we all know that you know four days out, people were unloading, thinking it was going to be soft, and then prices skyrocketed up to the game. Um, and, and you know, I think getting into resale, when you when you regardless whether prices are going up or going down, that's strictly consumer generated or market generated. And as the market, no different than any other thing, people either are jumping on or they're jumping off, and there's risk involved. But you know, from our perspective, regardless of the pricing and whether it's going up quickly or going down quickly, we just the, the system we created with the NFL is really about authenticity verified. Um, you know, kind of that check mark. It's a verified ticket. If you purchase it here, you know you'll get in. Um, having come from the arena side, I think that's the biggest fear factor. Whether it's a Super Bowl, a huge event like that, if you're going to lay out that kind of cash, you want to make sure you're getting in. Um, and uh, you know our platform brings that that validation, that verified ticket to the forefront. And so whether you you know got got beat a little bit on a, on the broker side and you released early and left a lot of money on the table and you're trying to grab it back quickly, uh, you know we don't really get in. We're kind of on the fringe of that. We're just the platform to verify it. Yeah. So I think you know as Kurt said, we we saw a market, right? We saw a real live market with the Super Bowl where it it surprised everyone. Um, and I think when you have surprises with price, you have folks that, um, you know, aren't necessarily ready to, to, to fulfill that um, on the secondary market. But, I, you know, at Subhub, we guarantee the fan gets in. And so every one of our fans that bought tickets got into that event. And I think that's the important part here um, is that, you know, regardless of, of where you're transacting on the secondary, it's, it's a secure platform. Do you recall what the average secondary price was for Super Bowl? I th Roughly? I think the get-in at the very end was around eight or nine, if I remember correctly. And, and Patrick, I think it's important to, to just note, too, as it relates to the Super Bowl and, and all of this conversation. And by the way, brokers um, and, and that topic in and of itself is a separate panel, right? We can talk about that for hours upon hours. But um, I don't think the brokers really got burned. I think they made bad business decisions. I think they were trying to sell something they never even had. Right, so they they were selling tickets that they didn't have in their possession. So that's I, I don't know. I guess you can call that a bad business business decision, but um, that's really what happened in, in in a lot of cases. And then not unlike what we're talking about up here across the board, it was a supply and demand, um, you know, um, issue. And and you know, smaller stadium in Arizona versus what we saw in MetLife, um, Seattle, Seahawks fans traveled really really well. Um, to that game. Geographically, they're not located very far uh, from where the Super Bowl was. So I think there are a number of factors, but I don't really think brokers got burned. I think they just, in a number of cases, made bad business decisions and sold something they didn't have. Question regarding, in terms of predictive analytics, 
how much the teams, the leagues, use secondary pricing from one year to predict or to set face value prices for your season tickets the next year, or just tickets in general? I mean, it, it's a big factor in how we do our season ticket pricing and our partial plan price and all the way up to our, our single game price. I mean, all, all of our historical data as we, as we track it over years all goes into our equation. So um, every layer of, of, of data that we can grab, we're going we're gonna to scrub it and try to set our pricing off of that. Yeah, we, we definitely use it. Um, we'll use it to forecast demand for games. So <clears throat> it's a big part of our variable pricing strategy. And then, you know, we use it as well for uh, an analyzing scaling in the building. So we've got years of uh, historical secondary market data that we'll use to sort of look at where are the, better, where are the right places to make price breaks and do we have the building scaled um, efficiently. So it, it's, a, it's a valuable piece. You know, I, I think we, the thing that we always have to take into account, especially when we start talking about using it for season ticket pricing decisions, is looking at the at the volume that may be happening in different areas. So we can see places where there's um, high average resale prices, but when you really look at it, it's not a lot of games where it's being resold and it's, and it's not a lot of seats. And so you really have to be careful. You don't want to get yourself into trouble relying too much on that, but it, it's certainly an input for us. I, I think it helps you understand the true capacity of your building as well. I mean, when you're, you have 18,230 seats, but you're selling 4,000 tickets on on the secondary, on just one channel through, say, StubHub, you know your demand's much higher than your actual capacity. So helps you understand how to position your caps on your season tickets, you know, how many single game tickets you want to hold back, and really maximize your revenues to the highest level. So, I, I think it's important to, you know, to know that it's a data point or it's one data point amongst many. Um, I agree with Anthony in terms of sample size is important. You got to be mindful of that. Um, but, you know, our, our analytics folks from the league office are out here somewhere and, you know, they remind me every day, it's not just about secondary data, that's one piece, which is often directional, um, but you have to also be looking at primary sales data, sell-through levels, renewal rates, um, all of those types of, of things as well. And then, tying back to some of the comments from earlier as it relates to value, I also think benefits and amenities and different things and loyalty and all of those things also factor into how you would potentially uh, price and, and, and scale your, your buildings. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenging balance because if, if, you, look at, if you look at the secondary market uh, transactions, right, you, you could say that that's, that that's market value, right? And, and I think for us, with our season ticket holders, we want to, as I talked about before, creating the best value for them. Um, they're our most avid fans, w without a doubt. Uh, and they are interested in coming to a lot of games. Now, they're not coming to all the games, but they're coming to a, a large portion of those. And so because of that, we want to give them a special price to be able to come to our games. That is below market because we want it to be affordable for our most avid fans to come to games. Where it becomes a difficult balance is there are people who um, buy those with the intention of reselling them for a profit. And so then those tickets start to compete with us on the primary market where we didn't intend for them to based on the price that we created for our most avid fans. So it becomes this really challenging um, situation of how do, we, how do we make sure that our best fans uh, have access to our games at an affordable price, but balance that against what it could result in in the, in the secondary market. And that's where it starts to become challenging, using that data, but also kind of understanding the, 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 the game theory of it. I asked a question backstage. Most of you are working in professional sports. Secondary pricing, dynamic pricing has been slow to come to college athletics. If you had to take a guess, a reason or two why, what would, what would you say? You want me to start that one? <laughs> uh, well, my alma mater, they're not very good, so, uh, although they're trying to build a new stadium. I, I, I think a lot of it has to do with students and, you know, universities fundamentally still, even though the alumni um, donation season seats are a big part of the big time football, big time basketball. I think there's still kind of a underlying, we got to take care of the students part of it um, that, that keeps that at a minimum. You know, ultimately, there's no reason why they shouldn't be using those tools because if, you know, again, most of these universities are still in the business to make money on their sporting events. And they're, they're pumping a lot of money into it. 
Um, it's big time business and they should treat it like a big time business. And if, if dynamic pricing or getting involved in resale is, is gonna help that grow a little bit um, and, it, and it funnels back into the university, then that's just good business. And you know, I don't know why they're a little slow to adopt that. It might be kind of the university politics. You know, there's, there's a lot that goes on uh, at a university level where ADs don't necessarily have that decision making power. It's gotta go. Um, through many channels. And, 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 and I know some schools, certainly at the school level, you see maybe conference and non-conference pricing, but I'm thinking in terms of, I know some research that's been done on March Madness and college football bowl games, where you see markdowns rather than markups for, in some cases, some of the bigger bowl games. So I'm just curious why you think some of these bowl game administrators, why the NCAA might be a little slow in adopting I think, you know, I think ultimately you are seeing dynamic pricing, right? You're seeing it on the secondary for all these tickets. Mm -hmm. I think, I do think we're gonna see it infiltrate the primary. I think what we'll probably see first is better prices, right? So you have your secondary ticket, your secondary market. I think in, in the years to come, you'll see more accurate primary prices. Mm -hmm. Whether we move to dynamic, I think it has to be tested out and iterated. I, you know, I think that large a game and that big a chunk of revenue um, you know, for the NCAA, to move to that all at once is a very big move. And if you're not successful, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of risk there. So I think, you know, I think you'll start to see, we partner with a number of these schools that are starting to dynamically price at the, at the individual game level at colleges. So I think you'll start to see a lot more testing and experimentation there and hopefully, you know, based on the results of that, we'll see where the industry moves. Part of the reason I make this suggestion is, especially with respect to March Madness, you get some of these pods, you get some of these regionals where if you're not lucky enough to have a good draw, you can have cavernous arenas. And the, why let the people on the street or why let, I'm just trying to think from the NCAA's perspective, why not try to get that revenue yourself as opposed to let it go, to, go elsewhere? Um, a lot of academic research shows that in professional sports, Prices, face value prices, are set in the inelastic range of the demand curve. A little economics 101 jargon. <laughs> and part of the reason for that is because you want to maximize revenue per seat. You get people into your building and they're going to buy a hot dog, they're going to park, they're going to do this and that. So one of the questions uh, posed by the MIT group was, uh, you know, Kelly and Anthony, do you find that dynamic pricing impacts revenues and these other purchases and, and concessions, merchandise. Has, has there been an impact? We haven't seen it. Um, it's, it's, at the end of the day, I mean, the consumer still needs to come to the game and eat and they want to get their beer and, and the demand is there. So again, it's consumer behaviors is built on demand. Um, we haven't seen a drop in any, in any of the uh, ancillary numbers. Yeah, I, I, I would say that we don't, um, from, from, the, from the magic, I, I don't know if we fully understand it yet, what the impact is. Um, you know, certainly going to dynamic pricing, in a lot of respects, our tickets have gotten more expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and hot dogs and those things in our building are pretty expensive as well. And, and so, you know, you could look at that and say, have we, have we raised the, the all-in cost of coming to a game? I'd, I'd say we probably have. What, what, it, what, what the impact of that is, um, I'm not sure. I, we'd love to understand, and we've had a lot of conversations about how we can better analyze um, pricing decisions that take into account expected spend and other aspects of the arena. It gets difficult for us because, and I think this varies from team to team, but um, parking revenue is, is zero for us. We don't, we don't own or operate garages. <clears throat> that could change in the future, but that's not, um, that's not uh, a revenue stream for us. Concessions, you know, we split that with the concessionaire. Um, and you know, relative to tickets, it's, it's not nearly the same magnitude in terms of the revenue stream. That being said, what's very important to us is repeat purchasing. And we have seen, um, we have seen a drop in some of the, the rates of repeat purchases within certain segments of our customers, which as we've done a lot of research is largely attributed to the cost of coming to a game. So you start to think about how do I price one game thinking about the fact that I want this person to, yeah, I want them to do some things when they're at this game, but I also want them to come to a second game and maybe a third game or a fourth game, especially you know, season tickets aren't for everyone. So these are really complex um, things to think about as you price one specific seat for one specific game. Patrick, I, I think too that you know a lot of the 
customers have already rationalized with what they have to spend before they make that purchase. So, you know, before they, they click the ticket, I don't think, and buy the ticket, I don't think they're going, oh, oh, I, I didn't think about it. I got to get parking and I'm, I'm going to have to buy dinner when I get there. They do, maybe they're going to make that choice on the way, on the way to the arena and, and, and eat dinner, but I think they've already rationalized with what they got to spend. Have you seen any data? I don't know if this is as voluminous in the other sports. I know baseball is more likely to draw fans from outside of the local MSA just because of the nature of the sport. Are there any trends or statistics that show that local fans, people that live within the MSA, are paying either higher or lower markups than people coming from out of town? I'm just curious if any of you have discovered that in your, in your work. We, we found that um, as we kind of researched primary buyer, and it's very interesting in Orlando because we have um, so many tourists that come and are really excited to see NBA basketball, and so we do a lot of business with people that are visiting. Um, we, we've certainly found over time in some of our research, the, the, the local fan is the one that's doing the most shopping around, and they're, and they're looking for the best price, because for them it's about seeing the home team. Um, so they are uh, less particular about the game that they're going to see, and, and really just focused on they want to see the Magic, so they're looking for the best price. So you know, I, I would say that they are finding ways to pay less. Um, they're not always necessarily finding those ways <clears throat> to pay less directly through us, which is something that we're focused on trying to, trying to figure out. I asked the question partially because anecdotally, living in St. Louis, living three miles from Scott Trade Center, if I want to go to a Blues game, I'm looking at StubHub and I can make my decision 30 minutes prior and still make it to the game on time. So I just was curious to see if there were trends as it relates to that. Yeah, I think that speaks to the, to the notion that really no event is sold out anymore. I mean, you can get a ticket almost to any event at any given time, just a matter of what you're willing to spend. So. Those, it's for us, it, it now transitions to focusing more on the, the, the customer experience when they come to the game and how we can maximize that, that opportunity uh, and make sure that they are coming back and make sure that they got the value out of the event. I asked Kurt to prognosticate earlier backstage, where are we going to see higher secondary ticket markups? And I threw out the May 2nd fight at MGM Grand in Las Vegas between Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather, and you suggested that there might be another event where the markups could be higher. Yeah, and I'd like to clarify that. I'm, I, I'm not a Grateful <laughs> Dead fan, but uh, there seems to be a, a, a buzz going on with that Soldier Field show uh, with the Grateful Dead reunion coming up. So um, it's, it's going to be massive, I think. And you know, the size of Soldier Field obviously will dictate those prices, but that'll be an interesting one. To, I think but, it, went on, it goes on sale today. I think. But in reverse, MGM Grand, I believe it seats 17000 I don't know if the face value prices have been listed yet, but uh, I have to imagine those are going to be astronomical. Yeah, I think that's going to be really tightly controlled by, yeah. by the MGM, and, and I think they have, enough, they have enough demand just in their universe that they'll be able to control that and maximize the price. And, all of their customers are going to probably pay absolute top dollar of... Well, talk about how they control it. They have every ticket in, in yeah. their hands, and Mark Prouse is going to say yes, no to everybody. So, <laughs> And uh, I know Mark well, so hopefully I get a yes. <laughs> As does Kurt. Are you going? <laughs> we'll see. Let me know if you need a wingman. <laughs> I'm going to turn to some of the questions from the audience. We have uh, just about 15 minutes left. And the first question trending here is, can teams differentiate between print-at-home tickets sold directly by the team versus those that have been resold online on the secondary market? And if they can, how useful is that data? So we can differentiate, we can differentiate someone showing up with a ticket that was print at home, whether they got it from us or whether they got it from somewhere else. Um, we don't have, uh, I wouldn't say that we have data where we could start to analyze like the, the degree of, of tickets that are print at home that are being sold. You know, you know what I mean? I don't know if that makes sense, but we, I don't know that we necessarily have that data. We, we have it to a certain extent kind of understanding the volume of transactions that are happening on other secondary sites just from basic monitoring, but. It kind of ends up being the same ticket. So it's not, I mean, once it's printed at home or uploaded, it's, it, it, the, it's kind of it's similar data, so. Yeah, I mean, the, the big difference is the teams that are doing delayed delivery, 
um, like the Yankees and, and some of the others out there that are, that are doing it, you know, that, that controls that barcode a lot more. So your time frame in which that barcode is uploaded and actually transacted, whether it's on StubHub or on TM Plus uh, through the verified marketplace, as delayed delivery starts coming in and that barcode suppression is held within 48 hours or 72 hours prior to a game, it'll be much, much easier to determine where it came from. Um, so that'll, that'll really, you know, that answer today is going to be very different next year as more teams adopt delayed delivery. Um, and, and we see that, you know, the demand from the teams is definitely there for that. So uh, we have a lot of them looking at it for the playoffs. And, and at, the, at the end of the day, you know, there, there truly is one system. If you're the ticketing provider for a team and there are tickets for sale on the verified marketplace for Ticketmaster through Warriors.com, you know 100% that that is a verified ticket. And it's authenticated because we have control of the barcodes. We, when it posts up, we know it's real. Um, and if it's resold on that system, again, barcode deactivates and reloads. So the life cycle of that barcode will, will really come into play. Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting. I'm, I'm excited to see that that question is at the forefront of this group's mind because I think at the end of the day, we all want choice. We want choice in where we buy our ticket. We want choice in how we get into the stadium, when we print our ticket. Um, and I, that's really important to us at StubHub, so we hope to see that, that the leagues continue to support that choice and, and don't continue to, to restrict when we're printing and, and how, we're, how we're using our ticket. No, yeah, I, I guess I'm the only one that hasn't commented, so I will. Um, yeah, we don't necessarily get too involved in, you know, telling our teams how to um, deliver their tickets. That's not something we, we're going to do at the league level. Um, so I certainly understand what, a, what Athena's getting at, um, for sure. I also am very familiar with delayed delivery and, and what Kurt's talking about, but that's not something that we would, we would drive from a league level. Robert, this one more specifically for you with the NFL. For the NFL, where there are a substantial number of season ticket holders, how do the prices in the secondary market one season affects next season's pricing? Well, again, you know, I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, a good number, fortunately, a good number of our tickets are sold on a season ticket basis. That's a, that's a good thing. I think you want to have that base and that foundation. Um, and, you know, as it relates to pricing and scaling your venues year over year, secondary market uh, information is just a piece of, uh, of that pie that our teams use. Um, again, it goes back to what we were talking about, and Anthony mentioned earlier, sample size. Um, you, can, you can certainly put too much emphasis on secondary market if the sample size isn't big enough. Um, but we, you know, we encourage our teams to look at everything um, year over year, whether it be secondary, primary data, um, again, the value that they're providing through benefits and amenities uh, to their fans, um, all of it rolled up in, in, into one, to one look. And, and, and then, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, again, Anthony, I think mentioned how you price and scale. Where are the breaks um, throughout your stadium uh, is, is very important. Um, so we encourage them to use all that data. It, it's a lot easier to price your building incorrectly than it is correctly. Um, so we would never um, encourage them to use just one, one piece of data. And th this is where the value of the season ticket holder really comes into play because a lot of teams are making their decisions in December and January before renewals on where that baseline is going to be for their season seat holder. And then if you go on a tear like the Kings and win the cup and you're kind of locked in on that rate, that's where the market really starts getting interesting because you can hold off on your single game pricing and your packages, et cetera. And then the true value of a winning team, a franchise that's crushing it, really comes to the season ticket holder at that point because they're kind of locked and loaded and they know they have their tickets next year when the demand's going to be through the roof. And that's why the season seat will always hold its value uh, across all the leagues. Um, it's as, a tale as old as time as, you know, will the season seat have value? And that's a perfect example of why it will. In the NFL, we talked about this backstage. In your experience, which teams see the highest markups, both at home and then on the road? Uh, it was Jessica here. I would say the Patriots, for sure, if Jessica's in the room. <laughs> um, no, I mean, Is that you know, true? Um, well, it's I think, look, they're, they're, you know, again, like we talked about earlier, certainly, Until you know, then. demand um, is going to drive price. That's where it all starts, and it cascades down from there. Uh, and then certainly, I think the, the next biggest factor is opponent. And I don't think it's any secret to anybody in this room. Um, you know, there are certain teams throughout our league that travel really, really, really well. You go to a, um, uh, you know, an NFL game and the Pittsburgh Steelers are in town, you're going to see, 
you know, thousands and thousands of terrible towels, right? Uh, the Cowboys travel really well. Uh, the Seahawks certainly, uh, over the last couple of, couple of years, um, have, have started to travel really, really well. So, you know, I think everyone in this room knows which teams in our league are going to drive rate um, when, they're, when they're coming into town. Really good question from the audience. In order to provide more accurate forecasting, how do you incentivize buyers to purchase early and not on game day? I can take that one. I think it's, for us, it's about understanding the customer funnel, so how they're moving through the conversion funnel. Um, and ultimately, if we see that early on, customers are not moving through that conversion funnel, then I think the price needs to come down a bit, and we need to get a little bit of supply off the market, such that as we're moving out, not only do you see folks who have bought already, but you're seeing a price that can be sustained until event time because there's not as much of a supply gut on the market. Another question from the audience. Have teams, ticket dealers, explored more experiential packages such as locker room access, stadium tours, premium seating, valet parking, to create a one-of-a-kind experience? Yeah, I mean, it's, teams are doing amazing things in this area. Uh, and they're just, you know, it, it's a profit, profit margin for them as well. I mean, they're using the Experience app to, to package a lot of that stuff. But again, on the season seat holder side, I think the experience that teams are delivering to the season seat holder, that value, um, all those things kind of come into play, whether it's team road trips, visits to the locker room, chalk talks with the coach. Um, teams are getting really, really good at setting that bar extremely high for their season seat holder so they can have all those um, kind of insider, insiders. I think that comes back to the loyalty platforms that I talked mm -hmm. about before. I mean, we, we allow all, all of our season ticket members to be able to cash in their points for experiences and they can choose whatever they want. If they want to cash it all in for discounts at, at the team store, that's great. But if they want to throw, go all in and get a Zamboni ride for their kid and that's a once in a lifetime experience that they want, um, you know, allow, they're and that makes them happy for the year, then it is what it is. That's what, that's what we want to provide at this point, rather than you know, just the free T-shirt and that yeah. says I'm a season ticket holder. Well, and I would just add, I mean, we offer those to our season ticket holders because they are our most valued customers and because those types of experiences are scarce. So they're not necessarily things that we would consider packaging with like a single game ticket sale because they're, they're so valuable and, they're, and we have so few of those really amazing experiences and opportunities to offer that we, we focus on offering them to our most invested fans. Well, that's one of the questions here following up. Do you think that for the consumer, season tickets are even worth it anymore? What yes. would you, yes. if you're, if yes. you're, if you're, yes. if you're selling it, yes. <laughs> if you're selling it to somebody, then sell us, Robert. Well, I think, look, I think there's no denying, I think it was a couple years ago, and I, I don't know who said it, but somebody had the idea that season tickets were dead, right, <laughs> and, and or dying, um, and they're certainly not in our league. Um, but you know, there's no denying or, or disputing the fact that the way people consume sports has changed. I, I get it. Um, you know, again, in our league, fantasy football, uh, the at-home viewing experience, the secondary market, all of these factors have changed, um, I think, you know, what we're talking about here. But at the end of the day, and it, ties, it does tie back to your last question, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is the emotional connection that people are looking for when it comes to being a, a fan of a team. Uh, or rooting for a certain team, or being part of some, something unique that they can't get anywhere else that takes them away from whatever is going on in their daily life. That's what we need to leverage. That's, 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 that's what it, it's all about. We're, we're in the business of creating memories, right? And exclusivity and access, yeah. that's, that's what we do. Um, and in order for us to leverage those things, that's where it, it all comes, it's a, it's a great way to almost end. That's where it, it comes full circle. We have to provide that value back to them. So I don't think season tickets will ever die because of that emotional connection. As long as we're leveraging that, 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 that will keep the season ticket business Kelly? Alive. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we talk so much about you know, the value of season tickets and how much money people are making on season tickets. And that, that's one value proposition that you know, we're certain to, certainly given to our, our, our account executives. But, um, you know, we come back to, and we've been very fortunate in LA with two championship teams that we, we manage with the Kings and the Galaxy. Um, and we often, often would say to people, you know, at the renewal periods, if they're considering on getting out, it's like, what would you have done if you missed that, you know, Dustin Brown 
you know, raising that cup for the first time because you didn't renew your season tickets or, you know, seeing David Beckham's last game, you know, when he, when he won the uh, MLS Cup or Landon Donovan this year winning the MLS Cup, if you couldn't have gotten in because you didn't have your season tickets, like, what's that worth? And, you know, those are the experience that we, we have to be able to bring that emotion and not lose that and, you know, quit talking about price so much. Price is one factor, um, but, you know, not everybody's around on a hedge fund with their season tickets. It's, uh, you know, it's, there is entertainment value there, and that's what we have to talk about. Yeah, I would say, if anything, uh, we're seeing that because of the integrated products, secondary and primary, you know, the, the old, old kind of school way of thinking was you had to hold back. If you were a hot team and you had 18,000 seats, you would only sell 14,000 of those season seats, and you would cap it so that you had this kind of flexibility to keep the marketplace um, pumping through your arena and creating new fans. But now that it's all one mar marketplace on one map, uh, teams are telling me that that's, that's an old thought, that they're actually increasing their season seats to kind of create that demand, and then the marketplace fulfills itself. And, and I just think that's a really interesting kind of change that uh, a technology has put out to teams to say, hey, you can kind of change the way you do your business. And your season seat actually has more value and it keeps climbing up. And to me, that, that's probably one of the coolest things is that the, the technology is actually helping teams sell more season seats. Another question to add here. Do you see the future of using click-to-purchase tickets via social media, perhaps for limited time deals like the fashion sites model, which I know nothing about fashion? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I know a thing or two about fashion. I don't know anything about social media. So hey, nice so so yeah, very nice socks. Thank I, you, Kelly. I appreciate that. I think, I think in the future you'll see lots of different innovations with promotions and incentives. So I do think to reach a certain segment of, of the generation that's coming up, social media is going to be that way. And so we've got to figure out how to innovate and how to get those folks to purchase. Um, and so I could, I could envision that. I, I think when you see, you know, on the team level, we see over 50% of our, our traffic, our, all of our digital traffic go into mobile, um, whether it be through our, our apps or through our social sites. Um, it, we have to start looking at that as an, a different channel right now and integrating with our ticketing partners appropriately. What about dynamically pricing corporate suites? Are we there yet? I mean, I think you, you see it now on the, yeah. the game by game suites. I mean, we certainly Agreed. do that with, you know, Staples Center, we have 16 event suites that we sell and we're always dynamically pricing those, so. And the theater boxes are a version yep. of that too. A lot of teams, if, if they're able to maximize, you know, not every city has 60 companies that can spend 350,000, 400,000 a year on a box, but they do have a budget of about 50,000 and so they're scaling down a lot of those boxes. Uh, recreating the experience into a theater terrace box type of situation and then maximizing profit. So that, in a, in a way, that's a variable pricing or a changing of how you put that product to market. I, I think also on the, on the sweet side of things, I mean, there's always a negotiation process on there and you probably see it. You just, it's not as transparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question from the audience. What do you see as the biggest risk for the team's dynamically pricing? If you are capturing all of the surplus, do you feel pressure on the product? To perform? Yes. I mean, if, if your general manager and your As coach doesn't feel... Yeah, if, the if, uh, if they don't feel pre pressure to perform, whether it's price or, or otherwise, I think uh, you probably have to make a change anyway. So. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, you know, for us, um, because I'm, I don't work in basketball operations, I mean, we, we focus on controlling what we can control. and. Um, today, it's, it's so much more than just a basketball game, it's, it's entertainment. Um, and that's why we built the arena that we built that offers so many opportunities and amenities. Um, we like to tell people our arena increased by a thousand seats, but it um, almost tripled in square footage. Uh, and that's because we offered a lot of other amenities for fans to create that all-encompassing entertainment experience. So we're really focused on those things, and I, I think that's a big part of the product as well. We find that through our research. A lot of people come to games where we don't win, but they still have a great time, and, they're, and they, they want to come back. They're excited to come back, and I think that's really important, too. I think you heard that on the panel yesterday about the venues of, of tomorrow. Um, the way they're thinking through venues and crowdsourcing ideas, would you like to see that? And then you know, taking all that feedback from the consumer and going out and creating an amazing experience in an arena. These arenas are just getting better and better because everybody's still in the next good idea and thinking of 
you know, the one that follows that and then the next person and the next person. So these arenas that are going up, whether it's Golden State and their new, their new facility that's coming or in Sacramento, um, it's just, again, adding more value to the fan overall. And, and um, I think that's why people will continue to buy tickets forever. Lawrence, did we, we have a winner? Nobody. No winner. We had a trivia question at the beginning, which uh, revealed the answer to now. I asked of the four major professional leagues in North America, name the most expensive and least expensive face ticket according to team marketing reports. Now, of course, based on the discussion that we've had here, uh, how relevant are these face value prices anymore? But these are of average ticket prices, not premium and not uh, uh, suites. So the answers are, in football, the Patriots at 122, the Cleveland Browns at 54. In hockey, the Toronto Maple Leafs at 114, the Florida Panthers at 33. In basketball, and this shows that value and pricing is not one and the same, the Knicks at 129, <laughs> and the New Orleans Pelicans, 40 cents less expensive than the Charlotte Hornets at 3020. And lastly, your Red Sox at $52, followed by the San Diego Padres at 16. Thank the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick.